Mr. Mortlock is the Director for International Economic Affairs for the National Security Council at the White House. He is responsible for sanctions, illicit finance, anti-corruption, and other international good governance initiatives. In this position, he was a key architect of the United States and international sanctions imposed on Russia, developed a strategy for continued easing of the sanctions on Burma, and coordinated interagency efforts to combat financing of ISIL. Previously, Mr. Mortlock had a number of positions at the U.S. Department of State, including Deputy Coordinator for Sanctions Policy, Special Assistant to the Under Secretary of Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, and the Attorney Advisor for Sanctions and Terrorism Finance. Today, Mr. Mortlock will be talking to us about the role of economics and national security. Mr. Mortlock is, however, most famous for being the son of Ms. Mortlock, our stats teacher here. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mortlock. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, it's um, uh, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a really impressive event. So uh, thank you to uh, Anita Chetty and Chris Nikoloff and all the faculty and students for having me here today. Um, it's a, a really fantastic opportunity to showcase uh, research and development. Uh, I'm thoroughly all here on a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, uh, Although I have to say I'm slightly intimidated uh, looking at the subjects uh, and hearing some of the talks from the, the other students, seeing the work outside the booths. Uh, I think I recognize about 50% of the words in the titles of the other speeches. So uh, you know, you'll, uh, you'll have to bear with me uh, that this is uh, fairly simple compared to much of the work that, that you're all doing. Uh, so congratulations. Um, so uh, as, uh, uh, as just mentioned, uh, I've got two uh, um, two roles that I'm here in the capacity of, and uh, one is uh, I work at the White House uh, in the, uh, at the National Security Council working on international economic issues. Uh, the other one is I am Mrs. Mortlock's son, so, uh, you know, both, uh, both rewarding and challenging roles uh, in, in, in different ways. Uh, so first for a little legal small print, I have to say I'm, I'm here in my personal capacity, I'm not speaking for the government, so keep that in mind when I go off script. Um, and I'm going to uh, 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 just, I think, uh, share what we all have in common. Uh, we do have something in common, which is I too used to go to high school. So um, I have that, although I certainly don't remember um, being involved in anything quite as impressive as, as the work I'm seeing today. Um, so between then and now, um, I've been, uh, been to college and law school. I worked for a judge. I was in private practice as a, as a lawyer. Uh, and then I spent about four years at the State Department um, during the first half of this administration um, before coming over to the White House uh, about two years ago. Uh, it's been a really fantastic experience. Uh, I want to share a couple of examples uh, of the way research and development has been uh, important to uh, economics and national security uh, in the work of the U.S. government. Um, but I will, say, uh, I will say I'm most interested in receiving your questions, so I'm going to leave plenty of time for, for Q&A and would invite you guys to uh, think, of, think of some good questions, uh, come up with something, something interesting. There were some great questions this morning for Dr. McClintock. Um, so I'd really encourage you to do that. Um, so the two issues I do want to mention, though, before we get to questions, uh, uh, they seem very different, but in a ways are very similar. And, and uh, the, the two issues are Ebola and Iran. Um, and while very different, uh, they are both examples of where we've really relied on research and development to pursue uh, a U.S. foreign policy agenda um, to try and make the world a slightly uh, more prosperous and safer place. Uh, one area where, so one area where research is, and development has really been key to our national security response uh, has been the response to Ebola. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a real tragedy, particularly in the three African countries uh, most directly affected. Uh, thousands have died, um, but the international response uh, to the situation there has prevented, uh, prevented the situation from be becoming much worse, from spreading outside those areas in any significant way. Uh, and frankly, we're now at a place where the infection rate is getting uh, very, very small, uh, almost down to zero new infections. So um, the, the international response has been extremely effective. Um, so we're thinking about how to make sure that stays the case, but also thinking long term. And so uh, in the longer term, uh, vaccines and therapeutics are going to be a key tool in our arsenal to addressing Ebola and future epidemics. So what we've done is we've significantly ramped up uh, development and cl clinical trials of vaccines and drug candidates. 
Um, so the US government was supporting development of multiple Ebola vaccine candidates in various stages of development. And so right now we've got two vaccine candidates in phase one human clinical trials. Uh, those are now being tested in a phase two, three clinical trial in Liberia. And we achieved a major milestone on February 2nd of this year with the launch of the Partnership for Research on Ebola Vaccines in Liberia, which is a phase two, three trial uh, in Liberia. In addition, the FDA is continuing to work with product sponsors, US government funding agencies, and international partners to clarify data, clinical studies, and regulatory requirements necessary to facilitate development and availability of the most promising vaccines and therapeutics. Because it's not just about the US government writing a check to buy vaccines. It's about creating the market conditions that are going to encourage the development of the vaccines, encourage the distribution of those, and to ensure they're made available, uh, not just um, at major hospitals here in the United States, but at the furthest reaches um, of, uh, of around the world. So we're hoping that this work would potentially mitigate the current Ebola outbreak, as well as future outbreaks. So one other thing on health and Ebola is uh, a few weeks ago, President Obama showcased some cutting edge gadgets in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. Uh, the hope is that these innovations will protect health workers on the front lines of the epidemic. Uh, and the President announced fighting Ebola, a grand challenge for development. Uh, it's a grant competition designed to challenge the world to invent better tools to tackle this disease in a matter of months, not years. So in just two months, we received more than 1,500 entries. One award nominee I thought was particularly cool uh, was from Johns Hopkins University. And they created a, uh, you see the pictures of uh, the, the, the uh, medical suits uh, that workers are wearing uh, in Liberia and, and West Africa. Um, and obviously those are key to protecting health workers. Um, well, the new suit uh, developed by Johns Hopkins, uh, it's a prototype with easy to open zippers, built-in cooling fan, and it all runs off a cell phone charger. Uh, the old suits took 22 steps and 15 minutes to take off safely. Uh, these new ones come off in less than 60 seconds, all in one fluid motion. Um, and so it's going to make a real difference in keeping health workers safe uh, as they're out in the field battling uh, this disease. Um, one other innovation, uh, which was incredibly simple, uh, but I thought uh, extremely smart, uh, was one student came up with the idea of um, uh, these suits when you're dealing with patients, frankly, they look pretty scary. Uh, and so the student's idea was to take photographs of all the health workers and then tape them to the front of the suit. So you see this scary faceless suit, uh, but with a smiling face of the person actually inside on top, which is gonna make the patients feel a lot more comfortable. I thought that was great. So with just a small amount of seed funding, these innovations have potential to improve the speed and impact of our response in West Africa and elsewhere to other epidemics. So our nation's life-saving response uh, to the worst of all epidemic in history represents, frankly, an impressive display of American values, commitment, and ingenuity. So even as the headlines have slowed, as the deaths have as well, the tireless work of thousands of frontline healthcare workers and disaster responders and innovators continues. So in a very different environment and a very different type of issue, uh, research and development has also been key, uh, not just uh, keeping people healthy, but keeping them safe. And that's in the, uh, in the context of the Iran negotiations, which you've all seen in the news the last few weeks. So you'll have seen uh, that negotiators uh, in Switzerland last week um, from the P5 plus one countries reached a historic framework deal uh, on Iran's nuclear program with negotiators from Iran. Um, that was an incredible feat, and those negotiations themselves were, were really impressive act of, of diplomacy um, and negotiation. Um, but it, the work on Iran's nuclear program precedes, uh, precedes that by uh, many, many years. And so it's worth taking a minute to remind ourselves how we got there um, to actually have a fairly successful um, negotiation last week. And over the past five years, the United States worked with international partners to put in place a broad array of sanctions to inflict economic pressure on Iran to get them back to the negotiating table. So over several years, interagency teams studied the Iranian economy, 
the oil market, and the global economy to determine how we could best put pressure on Iran without sinking the rest of the global economy. For example, Iran was the fourth largest exporter of oil in the world. So how do you take that much oil off the global market without dramatically increasing oil prices around the world and increasing the price of gas as a result? So through closely studying the oil markets, we're able to work with foreign governments, gradually reduce their purchases of Iranian oil, squeezing the Iranian revenue. Those countries that continue to purchase Iranian oil trap the proceeds in banks inside their country, severely limiting Iran's ability to spend that money. And this all coincided with a dramatic growth in alternative energy sources. And we're seeing the results of that, not just in Iran, but with oil prices dropping dramatically around the world over the last few months. Uh, and one key, one key element of that is the United States development uh, of shale. And the United States actually just became a net energy exporter, which frankly was unthinkable even a decade ago. And that's a result of massive amounts of innovation uh, and forward thinking on technologies that can be used to develop new energy sources. So going back to Iran, um, Iran might relies and still relies heavily on oil exports for about 80% of its public revenue. So by getting countries to relax their reliance on Iranian oil, we're able to take the majority of Iranian oil off the market. This, this had an incredible impact on Iran's economy over time. So for example, the official exchange rate was held a little over 12,000 reals to the dollar, but the black market rate was almost 20,000 reals to the dollar. And in one week alone, for example, price of chicken rose 30%, the price of vegetables in Iran 100%. So this obviously had an incredible impact, not just on the government, but the people of Iran. And a year and a half ago, Iran came back to the negotiating table. And the framework deal um, that was announced last week um, was a result of years and years of work um, in terms of um, giving, incentivizing Iran uh, to come back to the table. So much still needs to happen to, uh, to get to a final agreement. I, I won't um, speculate on, on what's to come. Um, and negotiations were resumed to flesh out the details. Um, but again, it's really worth thinking back about how we got here through the application of economics and science and research and development uh, to give ourselves these, uh, the ability to, uh, um, to get back to the negotiating table. So with both these examples, I hope it's, uh, I hope it's clear that, uh, that the research and development that's going on outside this room, uh, the talks you're hearing inside this room, actually have um, a really broad application. And so at the NSC, for example, um, we're looking at these, these issues every day. And the president's looking at these issues every day and how they can be used uh, in, um, um, in, in critical national security and foreign policy situations. Um, one other uh, thing I, I really want to mention is um, every year there is a summit of the G7 countries, the uh, seven world leaders from, from um, seven of the largest economies. Um, and this year it will be held in Germany, uh, Chancellor Merkel will host. Um, and so we'll go in June uh, to a place called Schloss Elmau in uh, Bavaria. So apparently it's very nice, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, and uh, you know, essentially the leaders will discuss what they can agree on, what they can get done. Um, and having those seven countries um, agree to something is, is a huge deal in terms of moving global policy. And one of the things um, we've uh, been looking at um, is, um, is how, to get more, uh, how to get more women and girls uh, into STEM education, uh, how to provide uh, women's empowerment, women's entrepreneurship uh, through um, vocational training in developing countries, STEM education in the G7 countries themselves, including here in the United States. Uh, and so, um, with Chancellor Merkel hosting the, um, uh, hosting the summit, and with this being such an important issue to the president, I think we're likely to see, my hope is we see some really uh, forward-leaning uh, innovations in global policy coming out of the summit on uh, ensuring we're getting uh, women and, and, uh, and girls uh, through that type of education and really expanding those opportunities. Um, so it's thrilling, to, it's thrilling to see that being done here. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to expand it to a larger scale. So um, I think we've left, we've left plenty of time for questions. It would be great. I'm really excited to, to talk about what you'd like to hear about. 
Um, I did see I was here for Dr. McClintock's speech uh, earlier, which was great. And frankly, the first question was the best, which was, have you ever hugged a penguin? So uh, I will get that one out of the way right away and say, no, unfortunately, I never have hugged a penguin. Um, I, I have hugged Hillary Clinton, uh, which I feel like is almost as cool as hugging a penguin. Um, so, you know, it's almost as good. But anyway, I'm, I, just in case that was one of the questions. Um, but, uh, um, but please, look forward to it and, and happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. So we'll begin addressing the questions that were submitted through Slido. So the first question is, what is the most exciting or unique thing about working at the White House? I'll use this one. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so the most interesting thing about working at the White House, um, you know, there's a, there's, uh, there's a lot of things. I mean, there's the completely superficial things like uh, meeting in the Situation Room and seeing the president and, uh, you know, I mean, that, that stuff never gets old. And I think, frankly, uh, if it does get old and boring, you need to find another place to work because... Um, you know, it's long hours, it's very intense, and so, you know, I think if you lose a little bit of the awe of where you're working, um, you know, you, you should find somewhere else to work. And, and so fortunately, I think, you know, every time I have a meeting that's at room, I think it's really cool. Uh, and every time I see the president or the vice president or, you know, any member of the, members of the cabinet walk by, I think it's really cool. And so I think it's, I think it's important to have that sense of awe. Uh, of where you are and remember, you know, no matter how long your day is, no matter how frustrating it is, uh, when you walk outside and sort of see the White House at night lit up, um, it's, it's a really thrilling experience every day. So, so that, certainly, that certainly is part of it. Um, but frankly, I think the most, uh, the most exciting thing about working there um, is, you know, in the daily grind, you sort of, you, you, you get very frustrated and you're fighting with people and, you know, people are standing in your, in your way. Um, and then when you step back and think, well, okay, but, but look at who I'm fighting with and look at what I'm fighting about, and you realize that actually you are, you know, in a small way, actually accomplishing something and making a difference. And, you know, the ability to actually get your own ideas on the agenda for, um, you know, a meeting amongst cabinet members and have them discuss and hear your words come out of the president's mouth, it's, you know, it's, it's really thrilling because you're able to steer... You know, I think in, in the words of um, in the words of the president, actually, in, in a recent talk to us, uh, you know, the the ability to steer history and um, you know and have your ideas get out there is is really incredible. And so, you know, really, it's it's all it takes is the um, the guts to say it out loud or write it in the paper. Um, and so, you know, frankly, it's really exciting to see you guys all doing the same thing with your work here and the presentations is just the guts to say out loud, uh, you know, I have an idea and people should listen to me. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, the next question is, when crafting effective sanctions, how do you effectively balance the intended harms on the target nation and collateral damage on the other nations who are often US allies? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, th this is, uh, it's a funny thing to work on because when you work on sanctions, nobody's really happy to be in the meeting um, because it means the situation is not great. Uh, things are not going well if you're looking at uh, deploying economic uh, and financial sanctions. So, uh, you know, I'm always like the spoiler at the party. If I'm in a meeting, nobody's really happy to be there. Um, so it's, it's, you know, whenever you're imposing sanctions, it's, it's not a good thing. There are costs to it, right? I mean, at very least, uh, you're preventing U.S. companies and U.S. businesses from engaging in certain transactions that they would otherwise make money from. Um, and so there's no question, uh, and when you're, you know, encouraging partners to take, make the same sacrifices, uh, there are always costs. Uh, and then, certainly in the last year, um, certainly dealing with Iran, as I mentioned, the global oil market, uh, and dealing with Russia, you're talking about a massive economy, uh, you know, very integrated with, um, with the international financial system. Uh, you've got to be really careful, you're, you're you know, uh, not to... Um, impose sort of systemic damage um, on on billions of people uh, as a result of taking these steps. So I think it's it's really a matter of um, 
uh, carefully looking at the op options and frankly being innovative. Um, you know, what we imposed on Cuba 50 years ago, just a straight embargo, um, you know, would not work if you imposed it on a, uh, on a country, you know, with a, with a massive economy and an integrated economy today. Um, so it's about being innovative in order to minimize the costs, but at the end of the day, you know, when you are shutting down economic uh, engagement with another country or, or other entities, um, you know, you're certainly making, making a, a sacrifice. Uh, and so it's really a question of when is the, uh, when is the national security risk uh, and the threat to um, our foreign policy so compelling that we're willing to, uh, we're willing to make those sacrifices. Uh, and then it comes down to the experts to say, well, we're willing to make those sacrifices, but we'd like those sacrifices to be as small as possible, please. Uh, and that's when we have to get creative. Okay, the next question is in response to Ebola, how can you ensure preventative measures to prevent future outbreaks when political or public will has faded? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. I mean, then this, this is kind of always the case with things you work on at the White House is, uh, you know, there's a, on one, you know when, when it's in the headlines, there's a lot of attention on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, there's meetings and me more meetings and you're writing updates and you're uh, getting the interagency together to look at it. And, you know, the, um, the downside of that is it's a, it's a lot of work and everybody's very excised about an issue. Um, but the upside is it's a real opportunity to get something done. You know, when you've got the attention of, of the president and, and high levels at the White House uh, on any issue, it's a, it's a real opportunity. You can actually move, you know, the agenda forward, get your ideas in there, make a difference. Um, but when those headlines fade, when some other issue has, has um, the attention um, of the highest levels, it does. It gets, it gets challenging to continue making progress. And, and Ebola is one area where um, it, we're going to have to really try hard to uh, continue um, to, to keep resources and attention um, and policymakers' um, uh, efforts focused on fighting Ebola, keeping the infection rate low, and frankly also planning for future epidemics. Um, so I, fortunately, I think it's something that we're still managing to do. Um, you know, we're certainly, uh, the, the G7 um, is, is still looking at the issue of health uh, and how we can, how we can, um, you know, how we can tackle Ebola, and the what uh, the president has launched an initiative called the Global Health Security Agenda, uh, and and many many countries have signed on to this as a way to say, okay, we need to be prepared for the next time there's an outbreak like this. You know, how do we deploy resources? How do we uh, deploy doctors? How do we deploy uh, other healthcare workers and the infrastructure needed to, um, uh, you know, needed to combat. Uh, an outbreak like this. Uh, you know, one thing we're actually looking at right now is how do we get greater internet connectivity in those three West African countries that have been most affected by the Ebola outbreak? Because obviously, if you've got better communications, you're able to talk to each other, you're able to respond more quickly to, um, to a threat like Ebola. So it's really, you know, as the sort of attention dies down, um, you know, there definitely is um, uh, a challenge to keep people focused on, on a subject like Ebola, but it's also an opportunity to sort of look more term and look at these vaccines that are going to take, you know, a long time to develop and look at uh, developing new technology like these, um, like these safety suits uh, and getting internet connectivity. So, you know, it's, it's basically you've got you to make the most of, uh, of the situation and keep, keep your focus on it even when the others don't. Okay, the next question is, because Iran wants to negotiate a treaty to lift economic sanctions, should we trust Iran to uphold their values and discontinue their nuclear program? <laughs> so, the, okay, so great question, and I'm going to kind of punch on this one a little, uh, <laughs> given the sensitivity of that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's uh, I, I, will let you, uh, I will let you speculate on that. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, the, the framework agreement that's been put in place is a, real, is a real accomplishment and certainly something we haven't seen in the negotiations with Iran from, uh, for many years, uh, for many, many years. And so I think that in itself is a huge accomplishment. It's a huge positive sign. Um, and, you know, you heard the president speak uh, on this uh, about a week and a half ago that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity. Uh, it's a real legitimate opportunity to, uh, for a resolution to the, to the situation with Iran. Um, having said that, I won't, uh, I won't speculate um, the likelihood of, of success. 
Um, I think I will say that you know I've I've got colleagues um, who, who are much more focused on this issue and on the negotiations, um, who uh, actually know what a uh, what a what a centrifuge looks like, um, and uh, you know they're they're working very hard, and I think. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a real testament to kind of the, the public servants, that, uh, the work of the White House and around the government, um, that they put so many hours uh, and days and, and nights uh, into these negotiations and, and trying to make progress on this issue. Um, so I think, you know, like, like you, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, but uh, I'm, I'm more confident knowing the people who are engaged on the issue are true dedicated public servants and um, I think are, are doing a great job uh, representing all of us uh, on this really tough issue. Hey, a little lighter question. What does a typical day at work look like for you? <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, that's a really good question. So um, there's there's no typical there's no typical day. Um, I mean, it's it's I kind of um, I basically spend my day split between two different roles. Um, uh, in addition to being uh, Mrs. Mortlock's son, but that one that one usually is is uh, uh, not every day, but. Uh, uh, well, I guess I am her son every day, but I don't see her every day. So, you know, but at work at least, um, essentially my job is kind of two roles. Uh, one role is kind of staffing. So, you know, something needs doing, um, uh, I get it done. And that's essentially, you know, it, it rolls downhill to me. And essentially, you know, that's everything from um, up, you know, writing papers to, to let um, senior staff and the president know what's going on, um, giving them updates, writing talking points, um, writing uh, briefing papers so they can then engage in a meeting and essentially staffing. And a lot of work I do, for example, on the G7 uh, summit coming up in June is really preparing the agenda and, and uh, uh, working with the other countries to, um, to prepare the agenda for the leaders who will then show up at the summit in June, discuss the issues we've been working on, um, hopefully read the points that, that I've written for them to say, um, and uh, and reach you know and and agree on on um, a, a statement on on numerous issues, so that's kind of fifty percent of my day is that sort of staffing role. Um, the other fifty percent of my day is there's a huge interagency, um, and you've got the State Department and Treasury Department, Commerce Department, you've got all these all these different agencies, um, and so the other half of my role is is what the NSC is supposed to be doing is coordinating, and so we really we coordinate the. Um, uh, the, the policy, uh, the decision, uh, the policy making process, the NSC coordinates among the agencies. So the idea is all the different agencies have their equities represented. You know, State Department's worried about its relationships with other countries and, and, uh, uh, and, and our foreign policy overseas. You know, Treasury obviously is worried about our sort of our, our economy and the health of the global economy. Um, this is putting it very simplistic, obviously, but you know, and then you know, the U.S. trade representative worried about our trade relationships, making progress on the trade agenda. Uh, so the goal is to basically, you know, through escalating steps of seniority, make decisions as an interagency, and we chair those meetings, uh, and also, frankly, to ensure work is getting done. Um, so um, I basically try and boss around a lot of people, um, none of whom work for me. Uh, and I don't write their reviews, so it's sometimes, sometimes they don't necessarily uh, 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 listen or agree with what I have to say, but, uh, but that's a big part of the job, and, and I joke, but it is, uh, it is actually one of the mo most rewarding parts of the job, is working with all these different people in the interagency um, at all levels. Uh, you know, it's just a really impressive um, group of people, and there are, there are people who are really dedicated and creative, uh, and, and come up with ideas uh, about what our policy should be and what, what the United States government should be doing around the world. Uh, and you know, being able to then sort of foster those ideas, bring them up through the policy making process, um, putting them to deputies and principals in the present, that's a really rewarding part of the job. So you know, in actual day to day, I send a lot of emails, uh, I get a lot of emails, uh, I, I sit in a lot of meetings, um, I chair meetings and then also, uh, you know, sort of backbench meetings where uh, people much more important than me talk to each other. Um, but it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's never boring. It's never boring. That's true. That's true. Okay. How did your parents influence your choice of a career? Oh, oh that's a great question. <laughs> that's a really good question. So um, it's a little odd, right? I mean, my mom's a math teacher uh, and my dad's an engineer. Uh, and so I said, well, I want to be a lawyer. Um, and I don't know whether I, I was just rebelling. Uh, I think that was my uh, form of rebellion. So obviously, 
quite the wild child. Um, so uh, you know, I so I went to I went to law school and um, uh, instead of going to you know engineering or, or uh, getting a you know getting a math degree or anything like that. And I think frankly the last um, math course I took was uh, my freshman year of college. Um, and uh, so you know it's 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 cert there's certainly not a direct correlation between what my parents did and what what I've done. Um, but having said that, I think uh, you know they influenced what I did quite a lot. And I think in two ways. Um, I think first of all, just in encouraging what I was interested in, um, and sort of being, you know, in, when I as I developed sort of interest in in politics and government uh, and law, uh, you know, they pushed me further into it and and sort of encouraged me to go in the direction I was passionate about. Um, and you know, that that's essentially what anybody needs, right? Um, and uh, and I think I think the other the other way they really guided my uh, guided me is. Um, is encourage me to sort of be uh, have alternative experiences, right? And uh, you know, I was um, fairly boring in many ways. In that, you know, I went to high school and then I went to college and then I went straight from college to law school and then straight from law school to get a job. And um, so, but you know, in between there, uh, there were experiences that they really encouraged that sort of made me uh, more interested in the world and, and more interested in creativity. And uh, you know, for example, when I was 17, some friends from uh, some friends I had known in England, growing up, uh, went backpacking around Europe, and uh, they're like, "Oh, do you want to come?" And my parents are like, "Oh yeah, you should totally go do that." Uh, and it was great. And frankly, now having done it, um, I think they were crazy because um, it was you know not the safest thing in the world to do. Is like send six 17-year-old guides off into the middle of Europe. Um, of course, we made only the best decisions. Um, and uh, it was completely responsible, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, having done it, I would never let my child do it. But, uh, <laughs> but thank God they were, uh, thank God they weren't that smart about it, uh, because you know, I think the the, the travel and the um, uh, you know encouraging me to travel, encouraging me to um, do different things, um, you know, that that was what uh, that was what I think led me to to where I am today, and. And you know, and the things I, I appreciate most about this job, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but you know, the the, the superficial stuff is, is really cool, right? Seeing the president and being in the room and, and having that experience of how decision you know, being able to see how decisions get made. Um, but sort of the personal experiences have, have in many ways also been the most rewarding, like, you know, traveling to Burma um, and going to uh, going to Baghdad, um, flying around in a helicopter with a with a flak jacket on and um, and uh, you know, going to the Middle East and, and meeting with officials there, uh, you know, th those have been the those have been the most sort of rewarding experiences, is to really see the world and have new experiences. And so, anyway, getting back to what the question was, is I think uh, you know, as as many of your parents do, I think by uh, obviously we're seeing the evidence today of of their support and encouragement. Uh, I think that's probably uh, you know the most important thing that led me to do what I'm doing now. So take advantage of it and ask them to do crazy things, and I hope they say yes. That's, uh, that's my advice. How much did the crisis of Ebola influence internal U.S. policies and institutions like the FDA, like speeding up paperwork for vaccines, using thresholds on drugs and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a huge amount. I think a huge amount. I mean, the, the way um, policymaking generally gets made is in the U.S. government is sort of, you know, at fairly lower levels, there's an there's a interagency policy committee um, which I often will chair on my issues, uh, and then gets escalated to a deputies meeting, which is sort of deputy cabinet rank, uh, and then principals, which are which are cabinet rank, uh, um, you know, members of the cabinet who who get together to make decisions. Uh, and essentially, these decisions get escalated as the more important, more sensitive they get. And what Ebola did is really push open the doors on that decision making process for the need to respond to Ebola and to epidemics. And you know, deputies are meeting frequently all the time. Um, and principals and the president and um, really when you've got that level of attention it means you can make some fairly significant changes and so I think what we were able to do with that level of attention and with the um, you know when, when you indicate from the highest levels that something is a priority like the need to respond to Ebola and to prepare for future epidemics um, people uh, start getting very creative uh, and sort of people ideas um, that someone over at FDA in a back room in a windowless office, might have had the whole time 
finally get an opportunity to, um, to see the light of day uh, and, and get elevated very quickly. And so I think, fortunately, we've, we've seen that over the last year in the Ebola context is that these great ideas that scientists and innovators had um, at the FDA included have suddenly gotten accelerated. And so, um, for example, we are seeing FDA working, um, you know, working on these vaccine studies, uh, and we are seeing, um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at new ideas about how we can encourage, um, you know, encourage those uh, individuals and the private sector that are developing the, um, uh, developing the vaccines. Um, so just to, give, just to give one example is, so, um, you know, if the U.S. government writes a check and buys vaccines, um, that's great. That's a really important first step because um, the, uh, the individuals making the vaccines uh, in the private sector uh, see pro the po potential for profit. Um, and so the US, the U.S. buys those vaccines. That individual, uh, that company, uh, makes money and so is incentivized to, to be innovative, produce the vaccines, um, and produce new vaccines. Now, that's great, but that doesn't solve the problem, right? Because you've then got to get those vaccines to uh, the people that need them. And sometimes, as in West Africa, it's, it's quite a long way away. Uh, and so a lot of the ideas that were developed in the as response to Ebola were about creating market conditions not just to create the vaccines, but also then to make sure that they were being distributed. And so how do you make, how do you make it attractive for the private sector to show that innovation, to develop vaccines, to be able to work their way through the FDA process, to deal with uh, legal liability issues, um, but then also how do you incentivize them to make sure that the pallet of vaccines are getting to Africa or all being, uh, uh, being produced in Africa so that they can be distributed locally. Um, and so it's really, um, and again, this is all about relying on much smarter people inside the U.S. government who are very clever about these things. Uh, and that's essentially most of my day is just finding people who are smarter than me and then, uh, and then you know, uh, transferring their ideas. Uh, but, uh, um, but I think, you know, in the, in the response to Ebola, uh, it really was um, an opportunity to make those fixes for the long term. And so I think, you know, we're now much better prepared and, and with the development of vaccines, with the, uh, and not just the development of vaccines, but creating the environment to incentivize the creation of vaccines, uh, we're in a much better place to respond to uh, epidemics in the future. What do you think is the future of energy in the United States? Cleaner fossil fuels or completely renewable energy? How soon is an energy transition possible? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. So we have um, the, a guy who, who works about uh, 20 feet from where I sit, um, is our director for climate change, uh, a guy called Kevin Welsh. And he, um, so he's working on all these issues and I work very closely with him because we're, uh, we're trying to do a lot of that work with the, with the G7 uh, and the G20 to include um, emerging markets as well like China and Brazil. Um, because obviously, uh, you know, this is an issue that we all need to act together with other uh, countries that are producing um, uh, you know, producing climate change as well. It's not just one country, it's, it's the entire globe. And so uh, it's about working together. And I, I think in terms of the future of energy, um, I think it's both. We're working on both angles. We're working both on um, cleaner fossil fuels and uh, we're also working on uh, renewable energy, right? So, you know, for example, um, the, um, the production of, of shale is, uh, is much, much cleaner um, than, than more... Um, uh, you know, than older energy sources. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we're looking at uh, promoting wind farms and making solar more cost effective. Um, we are um, uh, looking to cut back on dirty fossil fuels like coal-fired power plants, for example. Um, so I think it's really, um, uh, it's really about both. The solutions are about both clean fossil fuels and uh, renewable energy. Uh, but it's also, the other thing we're trying to do, the third thing, which really has to sit across all of that, is political will, right? And so, um, you know, if you don't get the commitment um, from world leaders um, to send the signal to their systems that we really need to make some changes, then changes don't get made. And fortunately, what we've seen 
Um, and right now what we're seeing is uh, G20 countries um, over the last few months have started rolling out um, their, um, their commitments on reducing fossil fuels by 2020. And I think you're seeing, uh, we just, you know, Mexico just made an announcement, Germany just made their announcement, we just made an announcement at the end of March. Uh, and I think, you know, by making those public commitments to saying we believe this is an issue, we are committed to attack it, um, and, and more specifically, this is what we intend to achieve by aiming at that target. It really puts the pressure on uh, the bureaucratic systems of our countries um, to, to come up with new ideas and push both on, uh, both on cleaner fossil fuels and renewables. So uh, I think we'll see more of that. And you know, there's, a, there's a very important meeting coming up in Paris in December um, that, uh, um, where, where most of, the, most of the developed world is going to get together to talk about uh, climate change and uh, in Paris, and I think um, you know our hope is coming out of that meeting, we'll see renewed energy, renewed commitment at the political level uh, for making these changes on on um, uh, combating climate change. Okay, so I think this will be our last question, the most popular question. Tell us a little bit about Miss Mortlock as a mother. <laughs> That's great. Uh, well, oh dear, uh, this is a challenging one. Uh, well, um, okay, well, you've stumped me now. Uh, that's, that's a hard one. So, uh, Ms. Mortlock as a mother, um, she's pretty much the same as she is as a teacher, I'm guessing. Um, a, uh, a little odd, uh, though uh, very entertaining, um, encouraging, um, and, uh, um, you know, it's very, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really hard one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, she's great. That is, that is, uh, let's just, let's just uh, put it there, maybe. I think, that's the, I think that's the best answer. She's great. So, and obviously, I wouldn't be here without her for, for many re in many different ways. Um, so full, full, credit, full credit to her for everything I talked about today um, in many different ways. So, um, so thanks very much. And, and, and just want to say, again, thank you very much. I mean, it's, this is truly, truly impressive event. And the work of the students here is really, really impressive. So, uh, you know, it's a privilege for me to be here to get to talk to you. And, I hope, uh, I hope what I said, even though I don't understand most of, uh, uh, most of what others are talking about, uh, I hope what I said has, has been useful, interesting, and um, really, uh, really appreciate being here. Thanks very much.